Hi, Dan Tokar here at the Willow Forge in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And today we're going to have a little classroom time. That's why I've got the blackboard up and uh, uh, it's not as exciting as being in the fire and, and hitting things with hammers. But there are some things that uh, I think we need to clear up because uh, I do watch other YouTube videos and uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, lack of understanding of some of the subtleties in uh, what's actually gone on in history and what it means in terms of material. Uh, so today's subject is wrought iron. And I'm not referring to an art style or uh, a decorative uh, um, motif. I'm talking about the material. Uh, iron. Uh, a thousand years ago, nobody had to uh, tell you uh, wrought iron. It was just iron because all iron was made the same way. Uh, basically, the problem we've got is, is that uh, people are creatures of habit and they tend to use the same terms and words for things even after they've changed. Uh, there's a lot of examples of that, like um, a computer used to be a person who actually figured things out on pencil and paper. It was a job description. So when they invented machines that did that, uh, they called the machine a computer. Uh, so in this case, what we're dealing with is, is that uh, iron was one thing, and as the technology changed, it kept evolving and changing, but people simply kept the name iron for everything that came along that was like that. Uh, so I'm going to give you uh, a quick background on processes and why we may not have uh, enough words or we have to add descriptions to the words um, to understand specifically what we're talking about. Okay, first background thing. This is a rough diagram of uh, an iron furnace. Uh, this is the sort of thing that was used for making bloom iron all the way back in the Iron Age, 800 BC. Uh, and believe it or not, bloomery furnaces uh, in one form or another were still in operation in the United States until I think 1906 up in the Hudson, Ri Hudson River Valley in New York. But anyway, you basically have a shaft, uh, you have iron ore, uh, you have uh, a tweer to pump air in, some sort of bellows or other way of making air, uh, and you have layers of iron ore and fuel, iron ore and fuel, iron ore and fuel, and as this burns down, uh, there are different zones in this column that, uh, starting up here, you have heat and uh, no oxygen because all the oxygen has been burned up by the fuel underneath. Then you have a neutral area uh, where it's about balanced between the amount of oxygen and the fuel. And down here, you have an oxidizing zone. The iron ore needs to be reduced, so it needs uh, a reducing area that's also hot enough uh, to react to uh, uh, turn the uh, iron oxide, the, uh, the iron ore, back into metallic iron. So you have sort of a preheating zone and then a reducing zone, a neutral zone. So as you keep adding more uh, as this burns down, you add more fuel and another layer of iron ore. Uh, and after a while, down here in the bottom, you accumulate a bloom, which is a ball, a spongy mass of little tiny bits of iron that have reduced out out of the iron ore and sort of stick to each other. And also slag, which is uh, partly residue from uh, uh, the charcoal that they were using as a fuel, because when 
charcoal burns, it makes an ash that melts and forms its own slag, plus uh, things they've added as a flux, or maybe just the, uh, the parent uh, uh, minerals in the iron ore. Um, the, all of these things are very locally dependent, uh, so that's when we go into this in some detail in a minute or so, uh, one of the reasons there's a lot of variability in this kind of a process. But anyway, after some length of time, depending on the size of the furnace and, and the uh, types of fuel and how finely ground it is and uh, how much air, uh, lots of variables like that, at some point you will get a mass down in the bottom of the furnace which contains uh, reduced iron, uh, uh, some residue from the, the minerals from the iron, uh, flux, slag, uh, it's just a mess of a material. And depending on how rich your iron ore was, it may have as much as 25% iron, something like that, or uh, even a lot less. Uh, we'll go get into that in a minute. But you, you uh, have some way of either opening a door and pulling this mass out, or you literally tear the uh, corner off the furnace. You pull this out and you hammer on it to consolidate uh, the iron because it's pretty much at a welding heat if you take it out at the right time. So you'll bash that, squeeze it, do things to try and drive as much of the pasty slag out because it's not hot enough for the slag to really be a liquid. Otherwise, it would have pooled in the bottom of the, uh, the furnace and you would have had a much more solid uh, bloom or, or mass of iron. So, so this spongy mass gets roughly worked and um, you reduce the amount of uh, mineral and slag material in it and you end up with something that again has a lot of variability of depending upon the skill of the people producing the bloom and the starting materials and the fuel and all those other variables that are, are hard to define. Um, but it's never a perfect uh, piece of metal. It's got an awful lot of, uh, well, junk in it. Uh, so to make it uh, more usable, more compact, uh, they would then have to uh, uh, work it in the forge fire by uh, taking it up to a welding heat and continuing to work it out. And you eventually end up with uh, small bars or strips that are fairly consolidated, but still have a fairly rough uh, texture, uh, a lot of slag still in it, and uh, they could either fold these over or bundle them together and re-weld them and keep working them that way until they drove more of the slag out. Uh, so it's a repeated high labor uh, kind of process to get a finer and finer grained material with less and less slag in it. Um, the slag did have some benefits in that uh, you could forge weld uh, that kind of bloom iron without having to add any flux because the flux was basically distributed as little uh, needles or um, uh, stringers of uh, uh, slag uh, through the body. Because if you take this ball and, and uh, turn it into a, a, a bloom, uh, into a block, and then forge that block out into a long bar, uh, all of the little bits and pieces are now distributed as uh, overlapping strings of slag distributed in the, in the iron. Now, I have here uh, a wrought iron bolt that spent 150 years in the Potomac River. And you can see uh, the woody grain, the lines in there. And those uh, are stringers of slag, which anchored the iron to keep it from progressively rusting. And it's one reason why wrought iron is very uh, resistant to weathering and rusting, because it gets a layer of oxides that form a skin anchored by those uh, little needles of uh, slag. Okay, this is the basic overview of the early process. So, 
Say we're still back in the era when uh, all the iron was made in those kinds of furnaces. Uh, you probably think that means that uh, all the iron was the same, except that because of the variability of the raw materials, the fuel, the furnaces, uh, the operators, um, there wasn't like a standard manual of operation for one of these things. People, even in the same general region, had a lot of variability in how they did this. There's some specifics about uh, uh, the variability in the iron produced in those uh, small bloomery furnaces. The first case you could have, I'll call that number one, is that they have gotten the um, the fuel and iron mixtures wrong, they have not gotten enough heat, they've got a bad furnace design, they're inexperienced. So in the first case, you get no iron. You run your furnace all day and you don't end up with a bloom. This is actually possible to do because if you mess up uh, uh, any part of operating that furnace, you're going to end up with basically uh, uh, iron ore floating around in some slag and no metallic iron at all. Uh, if you've run your furnace with too low of a temperature, uh, not a big enough reducing zone, uh, not enough fuel in relationship to the iron ore, like you've overloaded the iron ore, there's a lot of possible ways to fail in doing this project. So the first possible outcome is, is you get no iron at all. So we don't have to talk about that anymore. Uh, second possibility is you uh, run the furnace and you've done everything just right. You've got a gold star. Uh, you get iron with no carbon. Okay, and this kind of sounds uh, uh, like, well, obviously, iron has no carbon in it. That's why you call it iron. Okay, if you've run the furnace and your design is perfect and you've got all this going, you end up with iron that is basically uh, pure iron with some minor uh, uh, impurities in the iron itself and enough slag that's turned into little needles and stringers in the material. And it's basically soft material. It's got no carbon in it. You can't heat treat it. You can cold work it a little bit, but basically it's just iron. Okay. Now you've got three. What happens if your furnace has an overly large uh, reduction zone or the placement of the tweer is not right or you've run it for too prolonged of a period? Uh, you can have a mix of no carbon and carbon or steel. So instead of having a homogeneous uh, bloom that just has iron and slag in it, you can have a bloom that has some parts of it that are pure iron with tiny bits of impurities in it and, and some uh, slag in it. And other parts of the same bloom will have been in a reducing zone long enough to pick up some carbon and actually turn into uh, some kind of steel. And that can range everywhere from just a hint of carbon all the way up to stuff uh, uh, that's close to cast iron. Okay, so what do you do with a bloom like that? Well, uh, as you uh, uh, get to the point of uh, folding it and, and uh, re-welding it to consolidate the bloom, you actually can uh, benefit from this and use it as uh, um, a grade of steel. And because the amount of carbon that may be in that thing as a whole is unreliable. Uh, I doubt you could replicate the exact carbon content or even close to it from running even the same furnace and ore two or three times. Uh, 
um, they get used to trying to grade how good the steel is just by how it works and what you can do with it. It's also why when the uh, archaeologists dig up ancient iron weapons uh, and you see uh, that the pieces that are stuck together uh, have a high variability in carbon content uh, and sometimes it's not intentional. You'll actually find something like a knife where the highest carbon part of the knife is not on the edge, it's somewhere in the body or back of the knife just because they couldn't identify where the steel was and they hadn't refined it enough to try and homogenize and distribute the carbon content. So you end up with uh, things that seem like uh, backwards uh, to uh, a modern uh, uh, process where we know what carbon does. They didn't necessarily have a way of identifying it easily. There are examples in some places like in Japan where they'll run a large furnace and they would actually intentionally run it so that um, some parts of the furnace had a higher carbon content and some a lower. And they will grade it by uh, quenching the bloom and breaking it up with hammers. And they'll look at the fracture and they'll look at how ductile the material is, uh, how it deforms as a way of sorting out. So if there's a very large bloom from a furnace like that, you'll end up with a little pile that's iron, a little pile that's some low carbon steel, mild steel, some that's a medium carbon, some that's a high carbon. And uh, this is one reason why Japanese swords are made the way they are, is, is they took advantage of being able to sort pieces from large blooms and uh, make the edges and the, the uh, cutting parts of the sword or the tool from the high carbon steel and use the uh, medium or, or soft iron uh, for the bodies. So this is actually a fairly common occurrence. So you get a material that has the same stringers as what we would call wrought iron, but it does have a carbon content. Fourth, high Phosphor iron. Okay, in certain parts of the world, the iron ore uh, has a fairly high phosphorus content. Uh, it's also possible that with some fuels, uh, some kinds of charcoal, you can get more phosphorus in the reduced metal. So what you end up with is iron that has a fairly high uh, phosphorus content. Uh, high phosphorus iron um, is not like, I'll use that word, wrought iron. It's not like pure iron in that it changes the melting point of the iron and also the working properties. High phosphorus iron is fairly red short. It actually uh, uh, will shatter if you get it hot enough and hit it. Uh, so it's generally looked upon as a bad material uh, uh, to make things out of. And if they had had it back then, uh, they would try various things to try and uh, refine it to uh, get the phosphorus out, which would be uh, prolonged uh, uh, numbers of welding heats that uh, uh, you've folded and welded because uh, the phosphorus will get used up and uh, uh, escape from the metal by reacting with the iron oxide skin. Um, a high phosphorus iron is fairly corrosion resistant because of the phosphorus content, but again, it's kind of brittle and um, not good for hot working. And as a cold material, it is harder than pure iron, uh, but not as good as steel uh, in terms of making cutting edges and things. So if you end up with high phosphor iron, uh, sometimes they would uh, play games with trying to distribute it so that they would mix it with some soft iron and try and, and come up with a, a, a lower overall phosphor content, which leads to number five, low phos iron. Okay. Maybe you have iron ore that has just a little bit less phosphorus content 
uh, and you end up with iron uh, that has a little bit of phosphorus in it, but not that much, it will actually be a, a iron, not a steel, because there's no carbon in it, but it will be harder than pure iron, and it will also be more corrosion resistant, and if you etch it with acids, it will actually look brighter and whiter than just pure iron. Now, one reason I make the point of showing this is, is that back in the era when they made pattern welded swords, um, I don't like calling them Viking swords because a lot of people made uh, pattern welded swords. I mean, there are Anglo-Saxon pattern welded swords and a lot of them that probably came out of uh, the Frankish kingdoms and, and places in what would now be Germany along the Rhine River Valley. And they're not really sure exactly where some of them were made, but just say it was a widely distributed technology. But the Viking weapons are the ones that everybody uh, talks about and drools over. One of the things they did um, to make the cores of those swords, the, uh, the twisted bars in the core of a Viking sword, uh, was to use low phosphorus iron and regular pure iron as well as steel and make a laminate core that was bundled up because the low phosphorus iron was a higher contrast material and it also was more corrosion resistant. So if you were using weak organic acids like vinegar or using salt to etch the pattern in the blade, the low phosphorus iron would uh, give you a little more definition. It would resist being eaten and it would be a whiter, uh, higher contrast kind of a uh, uh, material. So if you read the, uh, the metal, metalographer's reports on some of those early weapons, you'll uh, occasionally see where they've identified high phosphorus iron as part of an intentional pattern material in the core of those swords. Okay. And then you have number six down here. You say cast iron and iron. It's also possible if you uh, really have a large furnace and you intend to make uh, bloom iron, um, they evolved eventually into what we think of as iron furnaces that make cast iron. Uh, there is uh, a possibility that if you either intentionally or accidentally have the right circumstances, you can end up with a bloom that has absorbed enough iron in some parts that you actually have produced cast iron and it will melt and uh, run around in the bloom and it may or may not stay in the bloom. It may actually pool in the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the furnace or it may find a place uh, in the bloom where it can exchange uh, carbon with the iron that's in there and make a higher carbon content steel uh, and kind of distribute itself. But it's possible to end up with a bloom that has uh, little spots of cast iron in it, uh, which make it uh, different to work and end up, once you've done as much homogenizing as you can, uh, a higher carbon content uh, uh, steel. Uh, as far as I know, this is generally the possibilities of what happens in those little furnaces. So if you were trying to run one of these things to make tools for your village, uh, you've got to learn how to deal with all of those different materials. That's pretty much the way it was for a couple of thousand years, from the beginning of the Iron Age until sometime in the Renaissance, when they started uh, getting those large furnaces um, that uh, uh, produce cast iron. So when you see those huge furnaces that have sort of the Coke bottle shape, that's, again, the internal that kind of furnace. And uh, these things are typically 25 feet tall, something like that. Uh, they're big. Uh, and you actually are able, 
uh, to to tap uh, and run out uh, pig iron have have uh, bars of uh, uh, cast iron because uh, this furnace is big enough long enough transition zone uh, that you can actually get enough carbon in it to melt and form a pool and you'll have another tap uh, higher up where you can tap off the slag so the slag will be floating on top of a pool of molten cast iron and if you're a good iron uh, master you can actually figure out when you tap the slag to let the slag out and then you can tap the, uh, the iron and make ingots. And a furnace like this, uh, if it's well run, uh, makes maybe anywhere from a thousand pounds to three or four tons of iron in a day. So uh, it's a scale up of the process. But you end up with cast iron, which, uh, sure, you can cast pots and pans out of it and, and make uh, other nifty things out of cast iron. But you, you have a hard time uh, uh, doing things like uh, making uh, swords or, or uh, chains uh, out of cast iron. You've got to convert that material into iron. So you've got to get the, the carbon out of it. So, this is why uh, they came up with the process of uh, uh, puddling. Uh, you had a furnace that had a basin kind of shape. And I'll put the... You had a fire. You had a fire over here and a passage and the hot gases from the fire came in here and rolled around and you had a chimney an exit over here for the waste gases to exit so you have the fire producing things and heat that rolls around because of the circular shape of the top and then an exit so you can very easily control uh, the kind of gases that you're making. You can make uh, a very oxidizing, uh, have enough air in this mixture that you get a hot fire, hot gases, um, and uh, uh, it's a, a, re a oxidizing atmosphere. In this basin, you'd put uh, some of that pig iron uh, in there and it would melt from the heat in here. I'm going to erase my, my, uh, my gases now. And they would have also taken uh, iron ore, broken up little bits of iron ore, and lined the bottom uh, of the, uh, uh, the puddling furnace with the iron ore. So when you ended up with a puddle of uh, cast iron, that was resting on a bed of iron ore and you have these gases swirling around that are oxidizing what it did is is it burned the carbon out of the pool of cast iron and some of the carbon was uh, uh, used to reduce the iron ore that was in the bottom of the bed so you actually made more iron uh, and you were getting the carbon out of this. So you had a guy who had a long tool called a rabble uh, that was sort of like um, a paddle-shaped thing on the end of a long iron bar. We're talking about maybe a 10-foot long iron bar. And he would stir this mixture up, agitate it to make sure that there are no cold spots and, and that it was uh, oxidizing evenly. And uh, as the carbon content goes down, the melting point goes up. One of the uh, important things in a, 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 uh, an operation like this is, is that cast iron melts at about 400, 500 degrees lower temperature than pure iron does. So as the carbon content goes up, the melting point goes down. As the closer you get to pure iron, 
uh, if you've regulated the temperature of this furnace correctly, the pure iron that's oxidized off the surface here will go solid because it's got a higher melting point. And the guy with the paddle is stirring this mix up and the iron which has frozen out will stick to his uh, tool, to his raveling iron. So over time, as he's agitating this mix with his rod, he gets a ball to form on the end of his rod that gets bigger and bigger as more and more of this oxidizes and that film of pure iron that's floating on the surface there uh, sticks to his ball because it's no longer uh, a liquid. At some point you get to the size where a man can't handle moving the ball on the end of the rod. You can imagine having a ball of iron about the size of a bowling ball on the end of that. Uh, and that's typically about what they did when this was a hand operation. Uh, the guy would keep rambling until he had a ball that was too big for him to move around uh, on the end of his rod, because the rod weighs something. So maybe you ended up with a, a 60, 75 pound ball of iron uh, floating around being rambled in this, this pool. And at that point, he has to pull it out of the furnace and they had a long handled uh, uh, iron lined wheelbarrow that his assistant would have over here say this is your your wheelbarrow with the long handles and as they pulled the ball out it would plop into the uh, wheelbarrow and they would wheel it over to the big hammer, which was probably, in most cases early on, a big water-powered trip hammer, you know, like a 200-pound chunk of metal as a hammerhead, some kind of a flat slab as an anvil. Uh, and they would forge this bowling ball-sized uh, 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 chunk of metal uh, into uh, some kind of a rough bar. Uh, you'll occasionally hear these things referred to as muck bars or, or things like that, but I don't know that those were terms that were used at the time, and in the modern world that, that term gets used for other sorts of uh, shapes, so I don't like using it. But the upshot is, is that, again, if you have done this process correctly, you have pure iron uh, in here, but you also have a little film of uh, uh, flux, slag, which is also floating on top of this uh, furnace. And because you've been peeling off these little floating layers, what you're really getting is sort of like an onion. Uh, there are these little layers of pure iron, and they have little bits of uh, slag, which are also stuck in between the layers that are in there. So just like a bloom, you do have uh, iron mixed with some kind of a slag. But the point is, is that if you do it this way, uh, you have probably 95% iron and maybe 5% slag, whereas a bloom uh, could very easily uh, be well over 50% uh, slag. Uh, so this is much more efficient, and because you use that large furnace that can make tons of iron a day, you can increase production. It's possible for a man to make an awful lot more iron um, in a puddling furnace. And this is also why you get place names, like when they talk about Valley Forge uh, and uh, Sloss Furnace, uh, the cast iron furnaces, the big reducing furnaces that made the pig iron, those place names are always called something or other furnace, like Hopewell Furnace. Um, the places that puddled the iron and made the pig iron into what we think of as wrought iron in the modern world, those were forges. So like Valley Forge, Pennsylvania was a place where they took the pig iron and made uh, wrought iron out of it. Now, how is this different uh, than what you got out of the bloom iron? Well, this has a lot less slag in it, 
and also because you're starting with a pig iron when you've made pig iron you have a different mix of trace elements because if you've actually got it molten from the iron ore it's picked up other things so quite often there's sulfur uh, manganese uh, other odd trace elements so you can actually do an analysis and find out whether you have something that started out as bloom iron or something that started out as puddled iron. And just as an example here, I have an old 18th century wrought iron hinge uh, that I am fairly sure was made out of bloom iron. And if you look at the uh, structure of what you see on the back of this hinge, you'll see lots of funny flakes as well as uh, grain lines. There's on the face of the hinge. You'll see things that look like that. Multiple layered flakes, fairly loose. Um, uh, if you see a layer like that, that's a sign that there was a lot more slag in that. So something that looks like that that's an example of something that was made out of reasonably high quality bloom iron, uh, probably in the 18th century. Now, this is a bar. I should hold it up. This is a bar of uh, 19th century iron that was made in a puddling furnace. And I broke this years ago to show the uh, iron texture in it and you can literally see that it breaks it looks like a piece of green wood that's broken but it has a much higher uh, iron content and you see very few uh, stringers uh, in the body of the material that uh, I have a different bar here and this is an example of uh, the kind of texture you'd find in, in puddled iron, as they would call it. Um, it's got some stringers in it. You can see those lines of uh, slag that are still in the bar. And like that uh, bolt that I showed you earlier, This is probably something um, that was uh, bloom iron because it does have a fairly high slag content, but it's in that transition period when it could just as easily have been puddled iron. But again, it's wrought iron, but it is a different material than the stuff that was the bloom iron that used to be what everybody called iron. So both of these things would have probably been referred to as just iron in the period when they were being produced. People didn't think they needed to say how it was made. Uh, I think the term wrought iron became in modern use uh, because they wanted to differentiate it from the iron that was produced in the more modern commercial uh, processes. So, okay, puddling, puddling iron was made from that pig iron, and that's, that's wonderful, except that you're limited to the size ball that a man can uh, manually handle in one of those puddling furnaces. So you end up with um, a bunch of these 75-pound bars that uh, don't really have enough size to make big things. Like say you wanted to make something like a ship anchor. Well, you'd be welding together piles of these little uh, 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 bars in order to get enough mass. And if you think about starting to have a rolling mill that's going to make something like, uh, say, a railroad rail. Uh, if you need a, a railroad rail that has five or six hundred pounds of material in it, 
all of a sudden you're starting to talk about needing eight or ten of these things to be welded together. All right, so what they did, <clears throat> I have some etched pieces here. This is again something, this is metal that was made in the era of uh, puddling. I have etched it in some acid and, and you can see the fine texture because this is a very fine textured piece because um, they would take a pile of those blooms or um, ingots that they made in the puddling furnace and they would stack them together uh, in a pattern on a big plate and weld them all together. So I did a diagonal section through this bar and etched it and you can see the piling pattern. That one thing in the center that has that uh, etched line around it, that was one of those blooms and they had another one right next to it right next to it. So this was like nine pieces, nine of those 75 pound ingots that were welded together probably under a big water powered hammer and then sent off to a rolling mill. And that's what would have been like a uh, uh, just a piece of bar stock that you would have bought commercially in, say, 1840, you know, pre-Civil War times. Uh, to get big pieces, they had to stack up piles of those man-sized balls in order to uh, run a rolling mill. Uh, so you had an awful lot of guys making a lot of balls. Here's the mating piece to that, where I cut the... Uh, the piece on the diagonal. And again, you can see that piled structure where they were welding together those blooms. I shouldn't call them blooms. So again, Maybe nine uh, of those 75 pound chunks were all welded together and uh, you know put in a giant furnace, big hammer, weld that chunk together and then pass it on to the rolling mill to make bar stock. And again, it has a slightly different composition uh, than the real bloom iron that was made from small blooms uh, in the small furnaces. These ingots, um, these billets, were probably uh, uh, fairly clean uh, in terms of uh, slag content, but still had a fair number of uh, impurities in the metal. Uh, you could still end up with uh, a fairly high manganese content. Uh, phosphorus, silicon, other things could get in there. Uh, not as high of a manganese content as modern uh, uh, steel, but probably more than you got in bloom iron. Uh, also, you start having other impurities that uh, uh, can sneak in there, like tiny, tiny, tiny bits of uh, other elements. Uh, anyway, a lot of variability still in the process. So, in the 1850s, they invented uh, things like the, the, uh, the Bessemer process. Uh, there's a process in, um, in England uh, that has a different name because, of course, the English and the Americans still argue about who invented the converter. But basically, what you ended up with is a chamber, a ladle, and you poured molten... Molten iron gets poured into this from the furnace, and you have uh, an air box with little tiny holes into here, and uh, high compressed air going in here. Air under enough pressure 
that it can force itself through the mass of the metal that it has a higher so rather than the molten metal coming through those little holes there's enough air pressure coming through here that it actually pushes the air through the mass of molten cast iron the pig iron the air reacts with the pig iron and just like a cutting torch reacts with the molten metal that you've made with the torch that's how cutting torches work they get the metal hot enough that when the oxygen hits it the oxygen burns the metal and the burning metal produces more heat which melts the burning metal and the uh, force of the oxygen blows it out you generate a huge amount of heat and you burn the carbon out and it makes its own heat to make up for the cooling effect of the air going through there and you get all sorts of gases and other things and uh, wild reaction coming out through the, the lid of this thing and because you're doing this in ton quantities you can also sample and also do scientific analysis of what's in the pot so you know when to stop blowing the air through when you reach the carbon content you want. And there he is to stop progress. Hi. Take iron this way, uh, as well as mild steel. This is a way of making ton quantities of uh, steel that you could cast into an ingot and do things like ro roll out railroad rails and things like that. This is one reason there was an explosion in uh, the amount of railroad track that could be laid in the country. They actually did go all the way to burn all the carbon out of some things. So they were making a material that some of the material was iron, but it had no slag in it. And I think this is the era when they invented the term wrought iron, uh, wrought meaning hammered, because most of the other processes that produced iron with uh, uh, stringers of slag in it uh, had to be worked by hammers uh, from spongy masses of things. So uh, as a, uh, a term to designate the difference between the iron that's being produced in a Bessemer converter, which can have no carbon in it if they want to, and the stuff that has no carbon that was made in a puddling furnace or even a bloomery, that's when they started using wrought iron as a term for the stuff that had the slag still in it. Okay, once they have these converters and they're making tons and tons of metal, they discover that there is a difference uh, between the wrought iron and the iron made in a converter in that it rusts more easily. Uh, and there are lots of application where the corrosion resistance uh, of wrought iron is much more important than its strength. Things like water pipe, uh, bridges, uh, architectural things like gates and railings and things like that. So they wanted to uh, retain uh, that weather resistance, but they also wanted to retain the ability to make it in large quantities, to not pay all the labor costs of running a puddling furnace. So uh, the, the, the Bayer process, uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. I've heard some people say Bayer, uh, like the aspirin company, but Bayer, Bayer, uh, there was a process that was invented that after the Bessemer converter had blown all the carbon, burned all the carbon out, they would pour in, uh, I'll use my little ladle here. They would have a ladle full of molten slag and they would pour in a prescribed amount of slag into the pot while this is very hot and they had a setup that allowed them to tumble this, that they'd have a lid and they could shake it and tumble it. And while the iron was cooling inside the, uh, the chamber, it was being mechanically mixed with uh, a certain amount of slag. And if you did it just the right way, controlling the temperature and the cooling rate, you could end up with a big ball that might weigh a couple of tons of iron that had a certain amount of uh, slag in it. Um, 
this was a way of making wrought iron, and this was uh, the buyer process. Now, I actually have a piece of buyer steel or buyer iron that I know for a fact was made by this process because I bought this new. Um, the buyer process was still in operation until the early 1970s. I think the last batch uh, that I know of was made uh, for the Lockhart uh, Steel Company in Pittsburgh in 1972. I opened my shop up in the late 70s, and in 1979, they still had wrought iron made by the bearer process available in the warehouse of the Lockhart Steel Company. I bought a full 4 by 8 foot uh, plate of wrought iron and had them shear it into 6 inch wide, 4 foot long plates. So this is one of those plates that I still own, 3 8 inch thick plate of buyer process wrought iron. And again, I still have the paperwork that proves that this is a virgin brand new piece of uh, wrought iron made by the buyer process. I have used up about half of that plate over the last 40 years making special projects and I've gotten very careful to keep it because it is one of those rare cases that you actually know uh, the provenance of a piece of wrought iron like that, exactly how it was made, what process. Okay, so that gets us up through uh, the 1850s um, I'm not sure exactly when the buyer process was invented, but I, I kind of think it was sometime in the 1870s, something like that. And a lot of these processes, even though they are technically obsolete, continue to be used because just like bloomery uh, iron was still being made for special purposes as late as 1906, uh, they were still running puddling furnaces at the same time as they had these big operations. So if you've got something like a wagon tire or a piece of uh, wrought iron uh, pipe, like old water pipe, uh, it's very hard without using a chemical test to try and determine exactly what process was used to produce it. Because even in the 20th century, you could have had a piece of pipe or a wrought iron bar made by any one of those three processes. Now, later on, um, they found a need for uh, uh, industrial commercial processes that needed really soft iron for doing things like drawing deep parts out of uh, sheet metal. Uh, so they started making uh, a zero carbon content iron uh, that was made again in a Bessemer converter and just rolled out. Uh, and you can't really call this wrought iron, it is iron but not rot because there's no uh, structure to it. There's no slag in it. And by the same token, uh, they now make hydrogen reduced iron powders that if you, you know some of the iron powders people use for canister Damascus uh, and some of the mosaic patterns and stuff, that is iron that was directly reduced by hydrogen and uh, basically it's, it's a fine powder, but you can't call it wrought iron because there isn't any slag content to it. One of the other things that was happening at this period, say the 19th century and early 20th century, is, is they were recycling iron, wrought iron, uh, for purposes, uh, uh, low quality purposes, like uh, buggy tires, wagon tires, uh, the, the rims, the metal rims on, on wagon wheels. And um, this was one of the cheapest materials. Uh, um, they wanted something that was easy to weld so that the smiths could make up tires of whatever size they needed. It didn't matter that it wasn't hard. It was much more that it was soft and formable, so it was easy to fit to a, a, a rim. Uh, so what they would do is, is they would buy scrap iron, uh, scrap yards, would then sell it to uh, the mills and the mills would take up a big stack of what they assumed was all wrought iron and put it on a plate, put it in a furnace, sprinkle a little flux on it, and then weld that all together and make a new piece of metal that they'd roll out into things like buggy tires. And 
I have an example of one of these sorts of things. This is a late 19th century buggy tire, a well used piece that was cut and then straightened out so I could use the material. And what I discovered when I was using this thing is, is that there are little pieces of what we would call mild steel that got into the scrap uh, flow that uh, even in the 19th and early 20th centuries scrap yards are dealing in volume and they're not checking every single piece they're grading it by uh, probably visual means so what happened was is that occasionally little pieces of, of mild steel and, and other things would get in the mix and get welded into those piles of scrap metal and you would end up with a buggy tire that's basically not homogenous in terms of carbon content or slag content. So if you ever run into a buggy tire that acts a little weird on you, it might well be that it's not actually made out of virgin wrought iron, but is made from recycled material that may have other things in it besides just pure iron. The other uh, Part of that uh, that is uh, also important to realize about wrought iron is, is that it was made in different grades that uh, particularly uh, in the last half of the 19th century, ornamental iron, uh, things like railings and gates and things were uh, a very important part of the business and they liked wrought iron for its corrosion resistance. Uh, and they wanted a nice refined material uh, so that it would look nice. So they would do uh, refining of wrought iron by uh, making sheer iron. They would take uh, brand new uh, uh, first sheer iron and cut it into pieces and stack up a big stack of it and weld that all together and draw it out and then cut that into pieces and uh, make a big block out of it and weld it together and draw that out. And you got a finer and finer texture with more evenly distributed um, uh, silica. So I had shown you um, this little thing before and I'll go back to it now and say that from the fine grain that that exhibits that this is probably um, a piece of late 19th century, uh, very similar to a piece of late 19th century uh, uh, iron. Uh, it could be an 1840s bloom that was uh, nine or so pieces welded together, or it could be uh, a second or third uh, sheer iron that was refined by stacking up a pile, but you end up with a very fine, evenly distributed um, structure like that, which is why you can see these very fine um, grain lines in it. And this is after I have etched it in acid for about a half an hour. It's got a very uh, rough, porous surface after that amount of time in the acid. Uh, but anyway, so uh, even with what you would think of as real wrought iron, there are different grades and textures to it. So if you're uh, scavenging iron from something like an old set of Victor Victorian railings around a house uh, or a fence, it might be a much finer grained material than you're used to seeing. The stuff that they used for things like bolts and uh, uh, chains and parts for ships like stay plates and things is probably a fairly coarse uh, uh, wrought iron, uh, more like the, uh, the big bolt I showed you earlier. All right, so why should any of this matter to you aside from being able to tell a little better what you're scavenging? I wanted to go down this pathway so you would understand what I'm saying about people who do modern reproductions of things like uh, Viking pattern welded swords. Um, there are some people who make uh, an attempt to get closer to the, uh, the look of a Viking sword or closer to the material by using 19th century wrought iron to replicate the bloomery iron that was found in the core of uh, those early swords. 
and I think this is closer than using modern mild steel. You get a little more of the structure, but it's still not a replication of the original to the extent of having the same material. It's still a different material. And the same thing about the high phosphor, low phosphor iron. A lot of those pattern welded swords were made with a low phosphor iron as well as a straight iron intentionally picked out for its corrosion resistant properties and the look of it that they knew they were familiar enough with their materials to be able to sort them out and use the materials. Now I have used some low phosphorus iron uh, that was produced uh, in the modern era and it is interesting material and uh, it's possible even to make some yourself uh, which might be another video but um, it's why I point out that uh, people who are trying to reproduce uh, the old work really do have constraints and limits on what's available to them even if you do make your own bloomery furnace and make your own iron you still are not guaranteed of having the same range of materials that may have been available to a smith a thousand years ago. Okay, and as another footnote to this whole process, uh, I will also point out that uh, when you're looking for scavenging iron, sometimes you'll find uh, um, metal that has uh, those lines that look like uh, wrought iron stringers in the, uh, the body of the bar, you'll see things that look kind of fibrous along a rolled length of a bar. And a lot of modern steel uh, has these as defects of the manufacturing, not that it's wrought iron, but that it's um, a mild steel that had uh, defects in the ingot. And I'm going to show you uh, this is one of the uh, casting sprues from an ingot of steel that was uh, uh, degassed and all of the gases that were still coming up through the sprue froze. So if you look at the cavities that are in this section of the, uh, the ingot sprue, you get a real good idea that even in modern steels there can be defects if any of these gas pockets was down in the ingot and you roll the ingot out, um, they do not always close up perfectly. So you can have voids and stringers, defects in modern mild steel that resemble the stringers in wrought iron but are not wrought iron. They are from things like these gas cavities in the uh, ingot casting. So what are we left with after all of this, uh, this long lecture? Well, we're left with the fact that there are uh, at least uh, four different processes uh, for making iron that you may come in contact with. And that these processes all, particularly the bloomery process, have some variability so that it's entirely possible to run into seven different materials that are called wrought iron and that most people would uh, uh, recognize as wrought iron without them being the same material. That if you get down in the weeds and look at uh, the trace elements and how the slag is distributed and what percentage of slag there is in the metal, they are all different. And 99 times out of 100, this will not make any difference in your work but um, just say this is deep background and if you ever do want to make a pattern welded viking sword it's another layer of the onion to go down through to see if you can channel your inner viking uh, swordsmith this is dan tokar at the willow forge in shepherdstown west virginia bye